The following podcast was recorded the morning of Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at arborresearch.com or biancoresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the latest edition of Talking Data. Our Talking Data series seeks to offer timely insights into macro market themes along with macro data and its impact on the economy and markets. I'm Kristen Radish of Arbor Research and Trading and I will be your host today. Our presenters are Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. Today, Jim and Ben will be discussing long end yields that are once again moving higher. Can it last? Tim, we're going to get started with you today. Are yields finally playing catch up relative to past global recoveries? Yeah, thanks. Um, before I answer that question, I, I do feel like I, I should mention something at the top. Um, a lot of people listening to this podcast are probably not bond investors. Oh, what do I care about bonds if they move up or they move down? Given, as we've talked about in our previous uh, podcast, the big valuations that you have in the uh, in the stock market indices. If fields were to head up higher a lot, that could really put a real crimp on risk assets. So it matters more than just for bond investors what's going on. Now to your question, <clears throat> are they playing catch up? That's been my contention all along, that I've always been holding the view that the bull market in bonds ended in March at 33 basis points in the 10 year and that we would eventually start to see yields head higher, um, sort of our kind of heading higher. They're in, back into around 91, 92 basis points. Uh, not enough to declare victory. They hit 97 basis points a couple of weeks ago. But I do think that the recovery that we've got and the belief that maybe inflation will start percolating is going to keep pushing yields higher from here and I suspect that that will be the case. Uh, before I turn it over to Ben, I'll just say one other quick thing about that. Um, what if I'm wrong? And what if we do trade back down to 33 basis points on the 10 year yield? Uh, the only way I see that is a very bad scenario in the economy. World economy, US economy has to fall back down to something that it approximated what it was back in the spring. So in order to get yields back down at that point, I think it would have to be very bad. Ben, what about you? How about this rise in yields? Yeah, I think that's the spot on point. So as everyone's seen in the media today and yesterday and, 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 and last week, where people are stacking up all of these items that typically correlated with 10-year note yields post-crisis. And that's things like ISM manufacturing that came out you know, rather strong today. The copper gold ratio, yeah, we can make fun of that as much as we want. There was a correlation, but that says yield should be much higher. Uh, the percentage of economies that are growing around 65%. That should imply that yields should already be at around one and a quarter percent for 10 years. I mean, you go down down the line. Um, and so I think that if yields were going to drop, yeah, I would agree. It'd have to be a pretty uh, disastrous scenario, or the Fed would have to come in with an incredible amount of of, of you know gunpowder um, to get that to happen, which I just don't, just don't see see that occurring. If you look back at past global recoveries since 1960, um, out of global slowdowns, which there's a, approximately six of them, typically yields do what they've done. They fall 125, 150 basis points, um, and then they slowly grind back to the upside. Now we're at a point where for the next three months, yields, uh, looking at the average move, should rise about 50 basis points from here into you know, the middle um, end of a Q1 next year. We're starting to kind of lose pace with that. So the question really, I think, for the court and investors is, Fine. Everything is start. It is saying that yields should be going higher, but they're not. And investors aren't positioning for that either. Um, if you look at swaps and premiums and so on, and it, it's kind of which we'll get at, at our last point here. Kind of this battle between Fed policy, its guidance, its willingness to keep rates low, but again, which is coupled with the lack of inflation, versus pretty much everything else saying that we should be getting higher yields um, moving forward. So um, it's it's gonna be the bait that's with us here for a while. Yeah, just to follow, just to put closure on this one section, I just say, <clears throat> remember that 
yields in general should follow expected nominal growth in an economy. As I'd like to say, why do some economies have a 10% yield and others have negative and others have five? We'll look at what their expected nominal growth is. Not their past, but their expected nominal growth. Nominal growth is made up of inflation and real growth. Well, for the last 25 years, we haven't had any inflation. So people have shorthanded that to mean that it's all about real growth. And that's why, as I jokingly said, that when yields go up, everybody breaks out in the course of God bless America, because it means that real growth is going and earnings are going. And that's why yields are going up. And that's why we all want to see higher yields. Well, that's been the case for 25 years. But the question now is, is that nominal growth now going to have a bigger inflation component to it as we move forward? Now, again, I've argued on these podcasts, if you give me core inflation at two and a half, I'll define that as an inflation issue, if not problem. I'm not looking for something approximating the late 70s or early 80s. And that, <coughs> excuse me, and that should get interest rates moving and moving higher. So if rates are going up and if growth is returning, I think it's also important that we understand why. Is it all real, which is not a bad thing, or is part of it inflation, which we haven't seen for a while. And a lot of people have kind of forgotten that it can happen, but it can happen and we'll see whether or not we get that as we move into 2021. Kirsten. Yeah, so you touched on inflation, and maybe, Ben, you can take it next just to dive more into um, inflation expectations. Sure, yeah. So they, they are on the brink. You know, Jim and I were talking earlier today, 30-year uh, tips break evens are pushing 194 basis points. If you look back to the turn of the century, that 180 to 190 basis point area has been either major support or major resistance for inflation expectations. So we're on the brink of you know, seeing a decisive break above that level. That's also being confirmed by some other metrics that say there's you know, now a 55% probability the headline CPI can hit 2% or above year over year for the next 10 years. So all this stuff is kind of culminating and starting to move in the direction that, yeah, okay, there's gonna be some inflation here, not in the long-term horizon, but really potentially um, you know, in the near term. And I think what is then happening um, is that a lot of the asset classes are now beginning to uh, more or less detach, lose the correlations, like the stock bond correlation that Jim talks about so much has lost its negative um, correlation in recent weeks and months. Um, same thing with like the VIX that I've always talked about, VIX versus tips break evens correlation. That's all of a sudden uh, starting to turn positive, meaning that inflation uh, becomes a hindrance to risk assets. So we have all these things that are culminating and really on the precipice. It's just that we haven't seen that that lunge yet. And I think for me, that is, um, you know, kind of relying on some of the more basic models of decomposing 10-year note yields and putting them into a gym set inflation premium, the, you know, real term premium um, and risk premium. And unfortunately, that inflation premium hasn't shown up yet. Uh, it's really been really flat, uh, even while tips break evens have widened so much thanks to liquidity um, uh, premiums coming down. So it's it, this next number of weeks, um, could be a big deal um, based on what happens to the correlations of risk assets relative to TIF break evens, inflation, and yields, um, and then also uh, the actual inflation prints themselves, and then what yields ultimately decide to do here to chase econ, improving econ growth or not. Um, so I think the onus is on investors finally pulling the trigger. I don't think that uh, they need more ducks necessarily to, to line up. I think it's more or less, are they going to have the conviction um, to potentially fight the Fed a little bit um, and really drive yields higher and to fully believe in this uh, reflation story. Completely agree with you on all of that. And I do think you're right. It's important to emphasize that if you want to deconstruct the data or look at the data, and if you say, okay, where is the inflation right now? It's hard to find it. This is more of an anticipatory call that if, by the time we get to the spring or maybe early summer, that it will have materialized, especially as we've talked about with the base effects, with the inflation numbers. Once you get past the reopenings, the lockdowns of April and May, um, when you look at the year over year numbers on inflation, they should be much higher just because you've gotten rid of that in the calculation. <clears throat> and that's known and understood. 
But I also think that on top of that, we might continue to see more of it. So it is an anticipatory call. And the other thing I want to point out, Ben, when you say the, the, the you know, 190 for this century, I'm old enough to think that that's 1900 when you say this century <laughs> as well. And the reason I bring up 1900 is uh, a number of equity guys have pointed out charts to me that said, oh, look at the 1940s, rates from, from 2% in the 1940s to the 1950s, they went to four or 5% and the stock market went up and there was no problem with that. So even if we get your inflation numbers in, rates go from 1% to four, <clears throat> no big deal, right? It's like, yeah, but there's a big difference now between the 1940s and now, and that is the extreme amount of leverage in the bond market. Um, who, you know, to, to, to answer from the stock investor standpoint again, well, why didn't anybody buy bonds? Because I can call up a broker and buy a billion dollars worth of bonds without any money. And then I can repo it out. I can get a billion dollar loan two seconds later. And then if the bond market rallies, it's all profit for me. Of course, if it goes down, I've got to pay those uh, losses. So the bond market is always operated on extreme leverage. There's no reg T in the bond market. You can go 100% levered on all of your trades um, in the treasury market. And a lot of hedge funds and a lot of banks do exactly that. So if you were to get a rise in yields from 1% or 90 basis points in the 10 year to one and a half or two by let's say middle part of next year, those are pretty hefty losses. And then if you add up onto that, the leverage on there, those could really be eye-opening losses. If you want an example of it, just remember last September, September, 2019, when we had um, the repo problem, in the market and repo went to 9% in one day and everybody lost their mind. And I know people that weren't in a bond market saying, so what? Repo went to 9% in one day. Well, you're not borrowing a billion dollars on 100% leverage and then watching your financing costs go to 9%. If you were, you'd freak out as well too. So keep in mind that these rise in rates, um, even though they don't sound a lot, a lot to the non-bond professional, they can materialize into something, If again, I'm presupposing that we do have a rise in rates, that uh, they can materialize into something quite significant, even for risk markets. Any final thoughts to summarize our topic today? Yeah, let me uh, jump real quick on uh, what uh, Jim was just saying. I think that, you know, the, the onus here being anticipatory, I think now means that, again, the onus is on investors. And I, as much as I don't love technical analysis, I think that really tracking um, the momentum and the amount of volume and inertia, especially maybe in, even on the implied volatility front behind this move in yields is going to be uh, critical. Uh, because I think they're kind of, again, they're the last, the last rung here, the last step of what needs to happen because they've been so ingrained in believing rates would remain so low, the curve would remain so flat, the Fed's always gonna come in, don't, don't worry that it's their conviction, it's investors' conviction here that's finally gonna allow yields to pop. It's not all of these things that are set, setting up. I mean, the, the outlook is good. Um, you can see, like you were joking, Jim, in our last podcast, the Roaring Twenties is a very common theme. Um, and we have, you know, 1.4 trillion in savings that's just sitting there to be spent once this vaccine um, is available. So there's a, there's a lot of um, optimism. It's just that bond investors haven't capitulated yet. Um, and so that's why I think you gotta watch for those breaks high volatility. I'd like to see some implied vol come back to treasuries. We got the little bounce that Jim and I thought was going to happen into the election. Uh, but I'd like to see some, uh, you know, fear of higher yields, some uh, hedging, for example, on the swaps in front um, and so on. And then some technical, real technical moves there in yields, not just these quick seven, eight, nine basis point rises uh, that eventually fall flat. So, um, you know, put on your technical analysis hats um, and watch that momentum as closely as you can. I'll just conclude with remembering that the push-pull in the bond market, too, is that to date, the Fed has purchased $3.8 trillion worth of bonds. That's since March 13th, $3.8 trillion worth of bonds in their permanent open market or PROMO operations, of which, you know, well over a trillion and a half of that has matured already, and that their net purchases has been somewhere in the low two, two to two and a half trillion dollar range. These are massively large numbers. And a lot of people have said, well, even if you get inflation or get all this and that, the Fed will just suppress interest rates. I think that works as long as you have a benign environment. 
that the Fed can and will suppress interest rates in a benign environment. When you start percolating inflation and the Fed tries to suppress interest rates, every bond investor is going to go, why do I own these things if they're not going to give me any more yield and the Fed is just holding the prices artificially high, yields low, I might as well sell them right now. And I've used the analogy many times, you know, that the Fed's a post in the ground and the market's a horse and the horse can rip the post up and run away. And that is something else to keep in mind as well, too. If we start to see those rise in yields, it will, the Fed can only stop it if it's a benign environment. But if it becomes less than that, it might be out of their control. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Ben, for your thoughts today. And thank you for our audience for joining us. As a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is an institutional research and brokerage firm. Our two most prominent research offerings are Bianco Research and Arbor Data Science. For further information on Arbor Research, Bianco Research and Arbor Data Science, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com.